I'm Jamie Good, and in February 2017, I visited Australia's Mornington Peninsula wine region. Just south of Melbourne, this region has established itself as Australia's most important for Pinot Noir, although it also makes excellent Chardonnay and very good Pinot Gris. In this two-part film, I'm introducing some of the leading producers and quizzing them about what's special about Mornington. Weekend, we planted five acres of vines on this property. I'll show you on the way out, and that, in fact. That five acre planting doubled the entire Mornington Peninsula plantings. If you added Nat White at Main Ridge, uh, Brian Stonier at Stonier's, George Kefford at Merrick's, and Bailey Meyer at LG Park, if you added their plantings, if you aggregated their plantings, they came up with five acres. We planted five, and in so doing, doubled the Mornington Peninsula. Today, there's two and a half thousand acres of vines right. on the Mornington Peninsula. So, were you sure it was going to work, or were you a gambler? Uh, I had a business plan. <laughs> I gave myself five years. Uh, and here's the interesting thing. Of the five acres, there was four acres of Cabernet Sauvignon, half an acre of Merlot, and a quarter acre each of Pinot and Chardonnay. <laughs> so were we ahead of the game or behind the game? I don't know. Um, was I sure it was going to work? No. I mean, I, we haven't got the time now to look at the history, how I went to Tasmania, discovered, wow, this is in the late 70s, discovered wine there that was nothing like Australian wine. It was fine. You know, I tasted Pinot. I tasted Gewurztraminer from Marilla Estate. Uh, and Pinot, I, I could be drinking Burgundy or Alsace wines. So I came back with the ambition to... No, I said to my wife, let's migrate to Tasmania. To which she said, you might find it a bit lonely. So I got the message. But then I, through a school connection, I discovered Nat White at Main Ridge, who had, at the time, a couple of acres planted up there, tasted his wines, I could be back in Tasmania. I eventually did plant a vineyard in Tasmania. Do you know Toll Puddle? Yes. Yeah. Well, I planted that in 1988. Cool. <laughs> I got there, eventually. Yeah. It took a while. Yeah. Um, I sort of almost wish I was still there. Uh, so we planted five acres. Since then, we've increased it up to current 12, 12 and a half, whatever it is. Uh, pulled out all the cabernet, <coughs> yeah. which is a bit. But, so, so, Sandra, tell me, tell me about this region. What makes it special? You've been here for a while now, yeah? Uh, yes, yeah, I've been here 22 years. So uh, yeah. it's a region that has a huge potential for quality. Yeah. There's some beautiful sites down here, and uh, I think it could well become or should be the premier region for the Pinot Noir, perhaps even Chardonnay goes forward in Australia. Um, so we need to be able to exploit that and to, to maximise um, the wines that we make from here. And you just started a new chapter, yeah? Yes, we have. Yeah. Yes, so, which is why I'm with uh, Karen and Martin, who um, share my vision, which is fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, You'll see that when we go next door, but uh, we think that we can grow higher quality grapes down here. We know we can. And we're, I'm very excited by the opportunity to do that. So time to talk. Excellent. Where, whereabouts are we? Tell, tell us about where we are. Right. Well, we're sitting here on uh, a little restaurant in the middle of Main Ridge on the Mornington Peninsula. Yeah. Um, one of the highest parts of, uh, of Mornington. And uh, looking down into our valleys where we have all our vineyards nestled away. Um, it's a wonderful area um, up in the hinterland with uh, these little microclimates that run through all these little valleys and uh, this is where we have our vineyards um, up here. It's a very cool part of Australia and um, ideal growing conditions for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And the microclimates, does, you mentioned earlier on that there's quite a lot of variation within quite small distances. Yeah, there is. So is yeah. that one of the features of the region? Well, we, that's right. I mean, there's, there's, there's the elevation, which changes very quickly. So from up the hill, down the hill, about 300 metres, about 200 metres here. So you can be up to three to four weeks of um, difference in harvest dates. But even in this valley here, which goes all the way down to Western Port, I mean, Mornington is surrounded by water. We get the cool air that comes up into this valley um, in the evenings, and um, so the impact of those cool breezes and those air flows from those big bodies of water that sit around us, the Tasman, the Port Phillip Bay, and Western Port, are also having a big impact. So it's something we're, I suppose, getting to understand more and more, but it obviously helps to explain why we see so many big differences and interesting differences in their wines 
8.1 meters wide by um, 75 centimeters. Gives you a total of 12,100 per hectare. Yeah. Your maths is good. Yeah. So you're basically getting that um, one to one ratio that you sort of would see in, in, in Burgundy as well. It's less than that. It's less than that, slightly less than that. Oh, it's only 10,000. Yeah, that's right. But um, yeah, you're coming along beautifully and, and we've, everything's it's 100% organic. We're going to um, a little Nico tractor which we'll show you before you go. Um, which uh, we forgot the keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, which is you know, which we're using to do all of the work, and um, yeah, it's very exciting. Is this the first vineyard like this in the yeah, well, yeah. Uh, well, Michael Dillon um, and, Rob Wal the first. and Rob Walters, but the first on the peninsula like yeah. this, yes. So they're basically two others. Yeah. Um, which are, you know, one acre. Well, actually, Rob's a few acres. Yeah. Um, this is the biggest. Yeah. One point five hectare. Only very few of us will actually be, actually get to see it. You know what I mean? But it's yeah. sort of the journey on the way. That's the it's the fun, fun thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, There's a line above the top line. There. I can't believe that. I really cannot believe it. But you can see it's just got it's got a lovely outlook, hasn't it? Um, so it's a it's a gentler sloping vineyard than the Macaccio vineyard. Um, but um, certainly up the top here. Produce 400 grams of fruit. That's it. Not two, three kilos. That's what we ask from a conventional vineyard. Yeah. We did. We started off, um, Jamie. We did. We scanned the. Did a full soil survey. Soil survey of the of this block. We dug soil pits. Um, we looked at, you know, obviously um, what what we needed to do from a nutrient point of view and sort of yeah just to the get the organics back up in the soil interestingly the organic matter was virtually zero here which I don't understand why it could be so low but it was so we put a lot of organic matter back in and tried to get the soil back to where it needs to be so it grew winter. and then planted not try and ameliorate yeah. afterwards so we grew winter winter oak crops and things like that and sort of plowed it back success, in yeah. and things it was really successful that worked really well yeah so Ultimately, is where where we're going to extend it, extend it to, and this is where we'll have our winery down on this, just down here on this, um, on the, this plateau up here, yeah. Yeah, just the edge of this plateau. But this was all all apple orchards, this whole valley, like a lot of grape growing areas, and grew really high quality apples, but could never really compete with the the bigger irrigated. Stuff and Eldridge was planted in 1984, and my late wife and I bought it in 1995. And we started a grafting campaign and totally changed it because it was two thirds Cabernet. <laughs> and now it's essentially Pinot and Chardonnay, and there's another couple of varieties, one of which I'm rather passionate about called Gamay. And the vines are now mature. Uh, what are they? Uh, Thirty-three years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. So they're pretty much mature. among the oldest, I guess, in the in the yeah. peninsula. Yeah. So yeah. they're still on their own roots. Yeah. But I have started a campaign of replanting, and the hardest thing that you can imagine is pulling off. When I started this campaign, which is about eight years, nine years ago, pulling out vines at that stage that are over twenty years old. Yeah. To replant with babies. But and is, is, is there phylloxera in the, the... There's none on the Mornington Peninsula, yeah. but it's in the Arrow Valley, which is only yeah. an hour and a bit away by car. And it was first appeared there in 2007. And 
it's already 40% of the valley is infected and the, they, they expect about 70% within another two years. So you've got to replant over there. So I figure if I've got old vines and it arrives on the peninsula, you're stupid to wait. You may as well start now, get 25%. So let's say it hits here in 10, 15 years, you've got an insurance policy and then you can plant another batch. So by the time you finish the program of replanting, your average age is still 15 years and you get decent stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. Insurance policy. About nice your vineyards and um, how you got to be here as well. Oh, basically, uh, we're working in, in Scotland and uh, we've we got involved in research. Yeah. Went to visit uh, places in Europe where wine was much more important than it was in Scotland. And really developed a love for it through, through that mechanism. Worked in South Africa for a while. The uh, then came to Australia where there was lots and lots of wine. Yeah. And uh, needing something outside medicine, uh, growing grapes seemed a good idea at the time. So this has gradually morphed from medicine into growing grapes. Uh, and now for the last 10, 15 years nearly, we've been all virtually full time uh, growing grapes. How big is the vineyard? Pardon? How big is the vineyard? Uh, I have 50, 56 acres. Uh, first grapes planted in 88, 1988. And now we're in the process of renewing some of the varieties, planting now on forks that are resistant rootstock as a bit of an insurance policy. And uh, looking, you're not always interested in getting new clothes of yeah. to, uh, to add to the eight or nine that we have already. And how many people do you sell to? Uh, about six different people. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay McCall from Premier yeah. is our yeah. biggest client, yeah. followed by Richard uh, at Rudaka State here, Stone Ears, yeah. uh, and a couple of others. And so it must be quite nice to be able to look at the different interpretations of your site. Well, it is very nice to be able to do that without having to go and sell the stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, marketing was never something yeah, yeah. that uh, I, I yeah. enjoyed, so I, I do enjoy it. And seeing that I was How expensive are your grapes? Are they very expensive? Does it cover... Very expensive, aren't they, Lindsay? Are they too cheap? Very expensive grapes, aren't they? Oh, so <laughs> Um... Look, I think uh, for a long time, grapes sat around, around $2,000 a tonne. I think we've moved over the last uh, yeah. 25 years, we're probably up around 4000 plus. And yeah. we'd expect to see for a tonne of Pinot Noir in the peninsula. Yeah. Very expensive growing area, yeah. but you're only cropping a tonne and a half to two tonnes an acre. But, uh, you've really got to uh, have a good price to make, it, make any sort of return, yeah. just on cash in, cash out, far less. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Capitalisation. Yeah. Mm. Excellent, thank you. thank you. Is netting expensive? Uh, well, they're expensive, but you know, they last a long time, so you get them sort of 10, 15 years out. But it's quite a job putting them on to <laughs> and take them all off. But the birds are so ferocious here that you just have to net. Yeah. And um, how long have you been here now, Tom? It's quite a while, yeah? It's coming up to nine years, yeah. yeah. So been a good ride. We're yeah. uh, very happy to have this new facility here and uh, everything on site. So it's yeah. uh, you know exciting times. And you, you must know your vineyards quite well. Now. Well, I know you do a, a series of single block releases each year. Um, has that been an interesting process, getting to know the site and the? Well, that's been the key of I suppose what we're doing here is trying to understand the potential of the vineyard. And um, right from the start, it was making every tiny section of the vineyard. Yeah into a separate wine, maturing it separately, assessing it, you know, re-evaluating what we're doing in the winery, how we can bring, you know, to life these little parcels of wine and what we can do to make them as best we possibly can. Um, so that understanding about the vineyard is sort of critical to adapting your winemaking to be able to produce the full potential of the vineyard. Yeah. And previously you were in the Yarra, mm -hmm. um, I still live there. I still live there. <laughs> what's what's the, the, the strength of Mornington as a region? Oh, I think the strength is clearly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. I mean, I think Chardonnays down here can be brilliant. Um, they probably should be more brilliant Chardonnays than there are. But um, you know, I think Pinot is a strong suit. It's more than half of the region is Pinot Noir. It's the focus of every producer down here. And, uh, you know, consistently, um, you know, Mornington Pinots are being rated, you know, well around Australia and the world. So I think that's the focus of every producer is to uh, continually improve Pinot Noir. Down here, basically. 
So we've been building for two years. We're pretty much, uh, pretty much done. A bit of landscaping to do outside. And, uh, it's a beautiful size, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, um, it's all contained inside as well. So it's all insulated, temperature controlled. Three with the nets on, four up behind it, five in front of the cellar door, six just down here, seven, eight behind the trees. No, anyway, it's too bad. Um, so tell me where we are. Uh, Windmill Vineyard, Merrick, yeah, Mornington Peninsula. Yeah. Soils? Uh, volcanic, basalt, basalt on basalt clay. And this is Pinot Noir, yeah? Pinot Noir, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about Estonia. Estonia, uh, Estonia was uh, one of the original wineries on the peninsula. Uh, started in 1978 as a very small um, enterprise, but gradually built up over the 80s. Um, sole focus on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which we feel are the two best uh, varieties for the region. And yeah, hopefully we're getting better every, every year. <laughs> I don't know, we tend to prefer more on the east, east aspect, easterly. Um, we just find the acids hold up better and they're brighter and have a nice leanness. Um, you can see there's not a lot of massive amount of fruit in here. This would be lucky to be, this vineyard probably averages three, three and a half tons a hectare. So it's, um, it seems to have settled in that rhythm of around that, that, that amount. Development for a winery, because all, all the wineries tend to be in back, you know, garages and old dairy sheds and things like that. This is a first purpose-built winery uh, on the peninsula, so uh, there's a lot of hoo-ha when this was first sort of opened. Um, it's, we're desperate to expand on it now, <laughs> sort of well and truly outgrown it. Um, yeah. Soon as the nets are on the, on the vines, he's after birds under the nets. Pinot Gris then, tell me about Pinot Gris. Oh, yes. Pinot is Pinot Gris, Gris, uh, Pinot Gris is our reputation. Yeah. yeah, and is that a story that's not really been told as well as it could have been? In, uh, in I think I think the, the, I think the story's been beautifully told um, by the country as a whole because yeah. it's been such a great success. Yeah. I, I, I think the region um, obsessed with Pinot Noir, it sometimes it forgets how important Pinot Gris is. And is it, is it easy to sell Pinot Gris? Uh, well, you only have to look at everybody's seller list yeah. and you'll see they're up to current vintage Pinot Gris. Yeah, yeah. Easiest. It's a very clear piece of evidence. Yeah. So Mornington's got a talent for Pinot Gris? Mornington's got a huge talent. Why do you, why do you, is it the journalists who don't like it or the, what is it? The... Look, I think in Australia, um, I think in Australia, okay, ready? Yeah. My view is, now this has got to be difficult because I want to sell wine to the English market, yeah, yeah. but my view is the English market and the English media never adopted Pinot Gris. Yeah. And so the Australian media um, takes a lot of its um, cues from the English media, so they never adopted. Pinot Gris. So they were very happy to hop on Sauvignon Blanc, but they were never happy to hop on to Pinot Gris. And in spite of that, I think that people love drinking Pinot Gris. So in the end, they had to talk about it because people just insist on buying it and mm. want to know more about it. Mm. And Pinot Gris is different from Chardonnay or Semillon, even Sauvignon Blanc or Riesling. It's just like Pinot Noir. It's site fastidious, loves a cool climate, has very low acidity. So when you grow it in a hot climate, you have to pick it very early to get any kind of acidity. So it's a, it is a variety that is suitable for cool climates. And I don't think those cool climates, there are not a lot of those climates in Australia. There's us and Tasmania.